Hi guys, so here we go. I'm going to start trying to do these lectures online. We'll see how well this works. I mean, it's the best we can do, right? Um, so, just to remind you before we start, if you want to ask me questions, there's a few places you can do that. Um, I set up a little interface on the course website, student questions. You can find it in the sidebar over on the left. If you click on that, I will set up a different question set for each lecture and homework assignment combination. Type a question in there over the course, sometime over the next day, I will notice it, I will answer it. You'll be able to see the answer, you will be able to see all the questions other people have asked and their answers as well. The second thing is on the course website, I have set up a Discord server. That's a, <clears throat> sorry, that's a live chat, text chat server. Um, sign up for that and there you can ping me, you can ask questions. Um, and I can answer questions there as well. I encourage you to sign up for the Discord server. That's probably the best way to discuss, to talk live with me, but also go, up, go ahead and ask student questions. And I will post on the website how you're supposed to turn in your homework. I don't I haven't 100% figured that out yet, but I will tell you that later. So uh, watch the course website for that. You need to keep watching the course website, which probably you were if you're watching this video at all. If you're not, <laughs> I hope I get through to you. Um, anyway, so more news items will be posted to the course website. So for today, we want to go into the second lecture about magnetic fields. Um, and so just to review, we had last time the Lorentz force, F equals Q times in parentheses E plus V cross P. This is the combined electric and magnetic force on a charged particle Q. So the uh, assumption behind this equation is that you have a single point charge who has charge Q. Q can be positive or negative. Notice the mass of the charge does not come into this force. If you wanted to figure out the acceleration, you'd use F equals MA that does have the mass. E is the electric field at the position where the charge is. V is the velocity of the charge. And B is the electric field, sorry, B is the magnetic field at the point where the charge is. Um, so looking at this so i've got um i've got here this electric field e and the magnetic field b and if you take a cross product of b and the velocity so b is supposed to look like it's going in the z direction and v is going in the x direction so if you take a cross product of v cross b right, so you hold up you hold up your right hand here's my right hand you orient it along v so v is that way and then you want to twist your hand. So, you know, I started it wrong. I realized I had to twist it here so that when I curl my fingers, they're putting along B, which is out of the screen. And so then V cross B is down. So that tells you that FB has to be in the minus Y direction. The, the other way that you could have done that um, is just by, if you notice, so V in this case was equal to, so V vector, the magnitude of V, if you look at it, it's in the X hat direction, um, B, vector was equal to b its magnitude in the z hat direction so v cross b is the same as v x hat cross b this is in parentheses z hat which um remember with the cross product i can pull the variables out front so that's going to v b v b times x hat cross z hat, and now you can just sort of look up. Oh, x hat cross z hat is minus y hat, so that's going to be minus v b y hat. So that tells you it's got magnitude vp, and it's in the minus y hat direction. That's the Lorentz force. Uh, sorry, that's the magnetic force. Then the um, electric force is just along the direction of uh, v for a positive charge. Notice here, this is a positive point charge that we've got. So the electric force is going to point in the x direction. Were this a negative charge, then the magnetic force would have been in the plus y and the electric force would have been in the minus y. So the net force F, and this is the problem with these, um, trying to do this 3D projection here, is the net force F is pointed in the plus x and minus z direction, sorry, plus x and minus y direction with no z component. Um, notice that the magnetic force has to be perpendicular to both B and V. And since there's no electric force in the Z direction and the magnetic force is all in the Z direction, there will be no net force in the F direction. That's easier to see on this bottom one when you use the convention that this little circle with a dot, which you see on both the Z axis and the magnetic field is pointing out of the screen. 
So if you look at assignment 10, problem 3, it was answer the two following questions in general. Um, in general, how does the direction of the acceleration due to the magnetic force compare to the direction of the velocity of the particle? Well, the force, the magnetic force, is V cross B. If you take a cross product of two vectors, the result is perpendicular to both vectors. So the direction of the force has to be perpendicular to the direction of the velocity. And then, so the acceleration is going to be along the direction of the force. So the acceleration is perpendicular to the velocity. Second question, how does the magnitude of acceleration due to magnetic force compare to the speed of the particle? This question is much harder. It does not. It is not going to be just linearly proportional to the speed. If, if the velocity and the magnetic field are perpendicular, then the magnitude of the acceleration is going to be just v times b because v cross b, if v and b are perpendicular to each other, two vectors perpendicular, their cross product has the magnitude that's the product of the magnitudes of the two vectors, but only in that case. So in general, for a given direction of velocity in a given magnetic field, faster speed is going to be more acceleration for a particle. Um, but the speed by itself isn't enough. You have to know how does the direction compare to the magnetic field and do the full cross product. This is one of the reasons why from the very beginning of Physics 141, I've insisted on doing vectors in all three dimensions and not trying to simplify it to, oh, let's just talk about X motion and Y motion and not worry too much about vectors. Um, I've gone full on with vectors because I knew that when finally, well, it happened with rotation too, but when we got to magnetic fields, there's no way but to hit the 3D head on. So I wanted you to have a lot of experience with that ahead of time. Um, so I've got some examples here on this page. I have a magnetic field that um, is in the um, z-hat direction. So if you look at my axis, z-hat's pointing out of the page. So here's the magnetic field in the z-hat direction. I've given you its magnitude. I've got three different possible velocities. So the first one here, it's 2.50 times 10 to the 6. That sounds very fast, but if this is like a proton or something, they tend to move fast. It is a lot less than 10 to the 8th meters per second. Um, and that's good because when you get to 10 to the 8th meters per second, it's close to the speed of light and scary stuff starts happening we don't want to worry about. So you have that V. Here's the second one is 2.16 X hat minus 1.25 Y hat, both times 10 to the 6 meters per second. Third one now is moving at a 45 degree angle because the X hat and Y hat have the same magnitude. And the second one is moving entirely in the minus Y hat direction. And all these cases, notice the acceleration is perpendicular to the velocity, also to the magnetic field because the magnetic field is out of the page. The acceleration is in the page. And in fact, on the right here, I've got what these accelerations work out to be if you actually do QV cross B. Um, the acceleration 10 to the 10th, there's no 10 to the 8th where we're here because the speed of light is a speed, not an acceleration. So you can't compare accelerations and speed like, speeds like that directly. Um, how would you, here's a question that I'm going to leave for the alert reader. And if you can't figure this out, ask me somewhere. How could you verify using these numbers I've given you here that these accelerations are perpendicular to these velocities? So think about that. So the magnetic force on a moving charge, remember the Lorentz force is this plus the electric force. The magnetic force always perpendicular to the magnetic field, always perpendicular to the velocity of the particle. And here's another thing this means. To change the speed, you have to have a component of acceleration along the velocity. Think about the little arrow vectors. If you want the arrow vector to get longer, that means you have to have some part of the rate of change of the arrow vector along the direction of the vector. If the rate of change of the arrow is perpendicular to the arrow, all that's going to do is turn it, change its direction. So remember, when something's moving around in a circle, it always has an acceleration towards the center. If it's moving at a constant speed, its acceleration is entirely towards the center of that circle. So that's an example of a case where the acceleration is perpendicular to the velocity. So magnetic fields will never change the speed of the particle because the acceleration is always perpendicular to the magnetic field. And both of these are different what happens with the electric field. So first of all, the electric force is always along, well, it's the electric force, the electric acceleration, the acceleration due to the electric force is along or opposite the direction of the electric field. It's along if Q is positive, it's opposite if Q is negative. So that's different. 
the magnetic force is perpendicular to the magnetic field, the electric force is either along or opposite the magnetic field. And because there is a force that's along the direction of the vector, well, if it's along the direction, I'm sorry, there can be, it's in whatever direction, right? There's, there's no need for the electric force to be perpendicular to the velocity. The magnetic force, because there's a cross product with the velocity, is always perpendicular to the velocity or zero. The electric force can be in whatever direction it is, so it's entirely possible to have a velocity that's in the same direction as the electric force. Why not? And if there is, that means there's a component along the velocity, the electric force um, can, and in general will, speed up or slow down particles. Just looking at the magnetic force, I mentioned circles, um, once again here you could do cross products. Um, so if you look at um, if you, if you look at the particle on the right, the magnetic field is out of the page, V. So once again, holding up my right hand, um, V is pointing in the upward direction and B is out of the page. So I have to orient my, this is my right hand. Uh, fingers up, B pointing out. You can see that um, my thumb is pointing in the right direction. So this particle on the right starts moving that way. It'll curve off to the right. Well, if you do that same exercise anywhere along this circle I make, it's pointing towards the center of the circle. And so that's going to give you, um, and that's going to work anywhere along the circle. If I go to the top of the circle, when now the velocity is to the right, and the magnetic field is out, the acceleration is down. So that's going to curve it uh, down, like here on the top of the circle, or curve it down. The thing will keep going all the way around in a circle. The particle on the left is negative. So QV, well, I do V cross B once again. And so V is up and magnetic field is out. I get a force to the right, but then Q is negative. If I multiply a vector by a negative number, it flips the direction of the vector. So now the force is that way. So a negative particle would go around in the other direction. This, by the way, is a way you can figure out if a particle is positive or negative. Move it through a magnetic field. Which way does it curve? That tells you the, whether the charge is positive or negative. And Ever since the earliest days of particle detectors, cloud chambers and uh, things like that, uh, that's how physicists would take pictures of bubbles or condensation left behind as particles moved through various chambers. And based on which way it curved, they could figure out what was the charge on the particle. Um, so you may remember from Physics 141, to stay in circular motion, a particle has to have an acceleration towards the center of the circle whose magnitude is mv squared over r. If we have B perpendicular to the circle, um, so just your starting velocity is perpendicular to V. If your velocity is perpendicular to V, or sorry, perpendicular to B, the velocity is along V. If the velocity is perpendicular to the magnetic field, um, then it will continue moving. Since there's no force along the direction of the magnetic field, there's no acceleration along the direction of the magnetic field. So if the velocity starts perpendicular, it'll stay perpendicular. So QVB will be the magnitude of that force. So it's going to move in a circle. The magnitude of the force QVB will equal to the magnitude MV squared over R. That'll tell you the radius R of the circle it moves in is MV over QB. But again, that's, that's when you, that's when V is at speed if, if V is perpendicular to B. That's the only time that works. All right. Now, so here's this. This is not going to work the same way it used to in lecture. So I've, I'm giving you a question. You remember in lecture, I would have asked you to think about it for a while and then hold up a letter. And then based on um, if it looked like enough people had the right answer, but not everyone had the right answer, I would have you talk to people near you. Um, hopefully, you guys would figure out amongst yourselves what the right answer is. And that worked sometimes and didn't always work. Obviously, that's not going to work here because you're all watching this video at a different time. So when you see these, here's what I want you to do. I want, I'm going to, I'll tell you what the question is. I encourage you to pause the video, think about it yourself, and commit yourself to one of these answers. The whole reason, the whole point of me asking these multiple choice questions is not to test you. I have tests for that. Um, the point of these multiple choice questions is to get you to think actively about the material of the course during lecture. It's too easy and all of us will slip into in lecture unless we're really trying to slip into just trying to write down what he's saying and not think about it too hard and get through the lecture and hope that what I wrote down I'll be able to figure out later. And it turns out that's not the best way to learn. The best way is to actively think about it while you're listening to it. And in fact, the notes you take should not try to be a transcription of what the person is saying. That's why I give you all these slides ahead of time. So you don't have to transcribe everything I wrote up on the board. Um, but things that will help you 
um, remember what you were thinking and help you remember what you got out of it at the time. So the reason I ask these questions is by making you commit to an answer, it forces you to think about it and try to work it out. And hopefully, if you work it out right, that'll help you figure out how to do this. If you work it out wrong, then um, hopefully you remember what you did wrong and it'll help you later. So the whole point of these questions is for you to think about actively about the question. So I encourage you to read the question, think about it, pause the video and only play again once, you're, once you've decided which answer you want. So to be clear here, all right, I'm saying a particle with negative charge Q. So this particle here has negative charge. I've made it negative so you can see that. It's moving in the plus X direction. There's a magnetic field of strength B in the minus Z direction. So these little circles with an X that indicates it's into the page. And if you look at my axes, Z is out of the page. And there's an electric field E that's in the plus Y direction. That's these little red arrows pointing up. The question is, at what speed must the particle be moving if its path is to remain in a straight line? All right, well, just to, to remember, um, if the particle is gonna move in a straight line, that means there can be no force in either the Y or Z directions because that would cause its path to curve. So you have to have force only in the X direction if you want the particle to keep moving in a straight line. So the question is, which of these possibilities I've given you, A through D, I've given you various different possibilities depending on Q, E, and B. It's also possible that E, that given what I've set up, whatever the particle speed is, if it's moving in the plus X direction, its path curves. There's no way to stay in a straight line. Or do you have to know the particle's mass? And so these expressions A through D really have to have an M in it. So pause the video now. Okay, I hope you paused and you thought about it. How do you decide this? Well, the Lorentz force on the particle appears at the top. We need the Lorentz force to have no component in the y direction, uh, which means that you would need to have the electric and magnetic forces balance out. If you look, the electric force is either going to be in the plus or y, minus y direction because the electric force is along the electric field. So this is a negative particle that tells us that the electric force is in the minus y direction because it's gonna point opposite the electric field. So we know the electric force is in the minus y direction. What's the direction of the magnetic force? So once again, right hand rule. So I pull up my right hand and um, I point it so that my fingers are pointing along the v direction. So v cross b, but then v b is into the board, right? So um, v is that way then B is into the page. I'm sorry, V is not into the board. V is to the right. B is the thing that's into the page. So I have to orient my fingers like this so that when I curl my hand, they point into the page. So V cross B is in the plus Y direction. But Q is negative, so the magnetic force is gonna be in the minus Y direction. The electric force is minus Y, the magnetic force is minus Y. It's gonna curve. It's gotta accelerate in the minus Y direction. So the answer to this one is E it will curve at any speed. So that's this next question. If I go to this next question here, you'll notice all I have changed is the magnetic field is now out of the page. So if I do the same exercise of I orient um, my hand V along the direction of the magnetic field, but now, or sorry, along the velocity. So V cross B, B is out of the page. V cross B is in the minus Y direction, but it's a negative charge. So the magnetic force is up. So now the magnetic force is in the plus Y direction because V is perpendicular to B. The magnitude of the magnetic force, just the magnetic force, is QVB, right? That's the magnitude. We've already figured out that it's in the, I already forgot what I said, but I think it's in the plus Y direction. The magnitude of the electric force is just QE because it always is. So if we have QE in the minus Y direction and QVB in the plus Y direction, we have to have QVB is equal to QE so that the plus and minus forces divide out. So we need V is equal to E over B. And so that says that the right answer in this case is D. The velocity has to be E over B and then it will keep moving in a straight line. Now I hear what you're saying. Dr. Knopf, all of that's in the past. Why don't you bring something up to date? So let's talk about current. You see what I did there? <laughs> okay, never mind. Um, current is a whole bunch of moving charges. Remember that? That's all current is, moving charges. That's all it is. And in fact, if you go back and you look at the notes from a while back, 
we define this thing drift velocity, and that is the velocity at which the charge carriers and a wire are moving. So you have a charge, Q, moving at drift velocity, V. We also defined the current, so that's I, is the just you know, current's just an amount. Well, what's the, the direction of the current is L hat. That's along the direction of the wire, which is also the direction of the drift velocity. So the current is just N, where N is the number density. Go back to the uh, lecture before where we talked about that, the number density of charge carriers. Q is the charge on one charge carrier. A is the cross-sectional area of the wire. And so if you put together all of these things, I times L times L hat, you'll notice what I did is multiplied both sides by L. So on the left, I have N times A times L times Q, where A times L, you may remember the volume of a cylinder is its base area times its height. In this case, the base area is L and the, or sorry, is A and the height is L. So that's the total volume of this piece of wire. And N is the number density. So the number density times the volume is the number of charge carriers. So the number of charge carriers times Q, the charge on one charge carrier, is the whole charge that's moving in the wire. So the right side is just Q times the drift velocity is exactly the same as the current um, times, so I've turned L, L hat into L vector here. So I, L vector, L vector is just a little length vector that has, has the length of the wire and points along the direction of the wire. So if you have a current that's got magnitude I and it's pointing in direction L vector and, it's, it's, and the current has length L, um, it is exactly the same as a, a charge Q moving at, at drift velocity VD. And so you can figure out the force on a wire and now we're getting to something where we could actually imagine measuring it in lab if uh, in some uh, future year we ever have lab again. Um, of course, measuring this is kind of hard, but you can qualitatively measure it. So you can get, if you have a length L of current I in magnetic field B, the force on that wire is just I L cross B. This is just QV cross B, but instead of talking about point charges, we talk about the current is the moving charges, so we just sort of change things around so it works for that. And then the direction of L is along the current. Well, so let's think about this. What is the direction of the net magnetic force on this loop of current? How do you figure that out? Well, we're going to use the I L cross B, but you've got four legs of the current that you have to think about. All right. Well, so let's start. So we'll start with the right leg. On the right leg, you have a current that's moving in the upward direction. So use your right hand. So I, so the length of the wire and the direction of the current is along that direction. So I, L, and then we cross it with B. So you orient your hand. So I, L, cross B, B is out. My thumb is pointing to the right. So the force on the le right leg is to the right. Now let's look at the left leg. So well, first of all, notice that the length of the left leg and the length of the right leg is the same, and the currents are the same, and the magnetic field is uniform, so the magnitudes of the force will be the same. On the left leg, and this is awkward, the uh, current is down, uh, magnetic field is out, so look, the force is to the left. So the right leg has a force to the right, the left leg has a force to the left, those two are going to cancel each other out. So now let's do the top and the bottom thing. So on the top, the current is going to the left, here, right? So you see the current is going to the left and the magnetic field is out. So the force on the top leg is up on that current. And if you look at the bottom leg, um, now the current is going to the right and the magnetic field is out. So the force is down. So the top and bottom legs cancel out. So there is no net magnetic force on this loop of current. I did that just by working out, um, doing IL cross B. First of all, noticing because it's a square, all the lengths are the same, the currents are the same, the magnetic field is uniform, noticing that um, uh, the magnitudes would be the same on each leg, left and right canceled, top and bottom canceled. So instead, let's look at this. Well, so first of all, left and right legs are easy in this case, because I L cross B is, um, well, I I L is parallel to B, so the cross product is going to be zero. So there's no force on the left and right legs. So let's do the top and bottom legs. Well, so in the top, um, on the top leg, you have I L going to the left, and then B is up. So that's a force that is into the page. And then on the bottom, you have I L going to the right, 
and a force this is up. So that's a force that's out of the page. So again, the forces are going to cancel out, but there's something here you need to notice. Notice on the bottom, it's out of the page. On the top, it's into the page. That's going to cause the whole thing to, to want to spin like this. So the whole thing will start to spin. And we'll talk about that a little later. Um, because it's important to know how to construct weapons, that is often the first thing that technology has been used for throughout the history of humanity. Sad but true. Um, let's build a rail gun, right? Everyone wants a rail gun. Um, and here is a basic idea for a rail gun. So what we've got is a current source. So that's what that little arrow means. And so that current, I have the arrow pointing down. So we've got a complete circuit, which goes around this uh, wire to the left and then the top and bottom rails. And then this uh, vertical blue thing here is a metal thing that can slide freely along the top and bottom rails. But it's metal, so it makes an electrical contact. So it can slide but it's metal, and so there's a closed circuit there. So current's gonna flow around, and in particular, on this uh, metal piece that can slide, the current is in the upward direction, just to make that whole current work out right. And so I could figure out, because the current is in the upward direction, that um, I, L, and then B is out of the page, so I orient my hand, I, L cross B, that the force is gonna be to the right. So this whole, the whole sliding thing, the slug there, will slide to the right, it'll accelerate to the right. And by the time it leaves the rails, it'll have picked up some speed and it'll go flying off. And so that's the basic idea of a rail gun is you use uh, magnetic fields and a current and you run a current through something um, that the magnetic field will then accelerate that current and send it shooting off in various directions. Well, okay. So up to now, we've been talking about how um, magnetic fields affect moving charged particles, including currents. Um, just like when we started with electric fields, we talked about how do electric fields push charges around, but then it turns out that charges were also the source of the electric field, and likewise, currents are the source of the magnetic field. So if you have a current, there will be a magnetic field, just like if you have a charge, there will be an electric field. Um, so one example uh, magnetic fields tend to be harder, but I'm going to give you a couple of cases where you can actually calculate what the magnetic field is. One is if you have a long wire, a long straight wire. So what do I mean by a long wire? It means that the length of the wire is very large compared to how far away from the wire you are thinking about the magnetic field. So the distance to one or the other end of the wire um, or where the wire bends and is no longer straight has to be very large compared to how far you are away from the wire. If you're around a wire like this, the magnetic field is going to point in circles around the wire. So you'll notice here I have the little arrows representing the magnetic field at various points in space around this wire. Um, so here, the, you know, the, and here's a way you can kind of figure it out. Is use your right hand. It always has to be the right hand. Point your thumb along the direction of the current and curl your fingers. It will curl around the direction of the magnetic field. So you see I have the thing coming out here. And then it's you know off to the right at the top and off to the left at the bottom and down on the left and up right. So my fingers are curling around in the direction of the magnetic field. That's the direction. If you um, want the magnitude, it's just mu naught. What's that? I'll come back to it in a moment. Times I, the current, divided by 2 pi. We know what 2 pi is. Um, times R, where R is the distance you are away from the wire. That's how strong the magnetic field will be. And mu naught is another one of these fundamental constants, sort of like Coulomb's constant. Mu naught has a value of 4 pi times 10 to the minus second newtons second squared per Coulomb squared. It just is what it is to make the magnetic field work out right in the units that we use. Here's another way of visualizing uh, the magnetic fields of a long wire. So uh, on the left here, I have a current. There's a little... Um, dot with a circle around it, that's a vector coming out of the page. So the current's coming out of the page. Go ahead, use your right hand rule. You'll see that I've drawn the arrows in the white direction. So, and, and I've violated my convention a little. Often we draw the tail of the arrow at the position where we're visualizing the field. Here I drew the center of the arrow at the position where we're visualizing the field. I just did that because it, it was more visually appealing. Notice that as you get farther away from the current, the arrows are getting shorter. That's saying that the magnitude of the magnetic field is smaller, farther away from the wire. On the bottom, here's another way of visualizing it. It's the field line way of visualizing it. Instead of drawing little arrows at each point to indicate what the vector is at that point, which really is a, the most direct way to visualize a magnetic field. 
Uh, instead of that, what we'll do is we'll draw the arrows and connect arrows together to make con continuous lines. And you see these field lines in circles. Um, and then the fact that the field lines get farther away have to do with the magnitude, but it's hard to get magnitudes off of field lines. On the right, we're just looking at it from a different angle. So on the left, the current was coming out of the page right at us. On the right, the current is going in the upward direction. So once again, get out your right hand and point it along the direction of the current. And you'll notice my fingers curve around. So over on the um, right side here, my fingers are pointing into the page. So those are the X vectors. And over on the left side, if I curl it around, my fingers point out of the page. Those are the little circle dot vectors. And you'll see, again, I've drawn them bigger, closer to the wire to indicate the magnitude falls off with distance. All right, so let's try and put these things together. Two long wires, a distance D or BART, are both carrying current I in the same direction. What is the direction of the force of one wire on the other wire? Well, how do you do this? It's just like we used to do with electric fields. If you had two charges, you figure out what is the electric field from one charge, and then what is the force that that electric field exerts on the other charge? Or if I had 17 charges and I wanted to figure the force on one of them, I would calculate the electric field from the other 16 charges and use that electric field with F equals QE to figure out the force on that one charge. But here we only have two, so it's easier. Well, so let's start. Let's figure out the magnetic field from the wire on the left and then figure out what the force of that is in the wire on the right. So get your right hand out again. So over on the left side of the page, you have a wire, a current's going in that direction. So if I curl my fingers around, you will notice over here um, to the right of the wire, the magnetic field points into the page. So let's go over to the right wire. The magnetic field is into the page. So if I do IL cross B, so IL, the current is in that direction up. And we decided that B was into the page. So I have to orient my hand like this so that when I bend my fingers, it goes into the page. Hey, look, the force is to the left. So these two wires will attract each other. Um, at least the wire. All right, so the force on the wire to the right is to the left. Let's go ahead and do, I mean, they will attract each other. There's symmetry. Let's do the other one just to be sure. So on the left, um, sorry, on the right, we're going to do the magnetic field from the one on the right and get the force on the left. On the right, again, current in that direction. Uh, and you will notice now, um, to the left of that wire, the, mag the magnetic field points out of the page. So if I go over to the left wire, again, I have QL, and I orient my hand so that when I bend it, it points out of the page, and look, the force is to the right. So the force on the left wire is to the right. So these two wires will attract each other. I could do the same exercise here where I have two wires carrying current in the opposite direction. Um, and you're going to get the opposite answer. They're going to repel each other in this case. But let's work through it again just to make sure we know how to do it. So start with the wire on the left um, has a current. So for this, you point your thumb in the direction of the current uh, in that direction. So to the right of the wire on the left, notice that the magnetic field points into the page. So over on the other side, now I have to orient my hand so that it points down along IL, and then bend my fingers so that they point in the direction of B, which we decided was into the page on the right wire. And now the force is to the right. So notice that the force is um, repulsive. And just, again, to make sure it all works out, let's start with the wire on the right, work out its magnetic field. So the wire on the right, the current's that way. Its magnetic field is like, is like this. So over to the left of it, the magnetic field is into the page. So at the position of the left wire, the magnetic field of the right wire is into the page. So now we can do IL for the left wire cross B, which is into the page. So I need to do it like this, boom. And notice the force is to the left. So it's being pushed away from the other wire. So you have two currents in opposite directions. They will tend to repel each other because of the magnetic force. Two long wires, a distance D apart, are both carrying current I in the opposite direction. What is the force per unit length of wire of one wire on the other? So now we have to do some calculations. All right, got to put my glasses on so I can see what I'm doing. I have a little screen recorder that I start and I go to my little markers program. All right, so again, we have two wires. The currents are in opposite directions. So here's one wire. The current's that way. Here's the other wire. And the distance between them is D, right? So first of all, if you, if you use the right-hand rule, you can figure out that the 
magnetic field of the left wire at the position of the white wire is into the page, right? We did that before. What's more, we know that that magnetic field is going to equal mu naught i over 2 pi d, because that was the equation I gave you for the magnetic field, the magnitude of the magnetic field around a wire. And so now the current on the left, well, you know that the force is uh, not Q. So now let's see if I know how to erase with this thing. Ooh, look, I do. Um, the force on the left is I L cross B. Right, so we work out that the direction before that this is going to be repulsive. So it's going to be to the right. L and B are perpendicular to each other. So in this case, it works out that the force is ILB. And we know what B is. The force B is just mu naught I over 2 pi D. So it's going to become mu naught I squared L over 2 pi D. That is the magnitude of the force on length on the length of the right wire, length L of the light right wire, of course, what did I ask was force per unit length. Well, that's just the force divided by the length is what that is, is mu naught I squared over two pi D. So that's how you can actually work out what is the magnetic force on uh, these two wires that are next to each other. couple more things. Um, the magnetic field, if you do a circular loop of current, well, what you can do is close to the wires, you can just pretend it's a long wire, although it's really not because it's curving the whole time. But you will get magnetic field lines that loop around like this. So notice in the center of the, of the loop, um, the magnetic field is perpendicular to the plane of the loop everywhere. And you could use your right hand rule to figure out that that's the right direction anywhere along the outside. Point your thumb along the direction of the current, curl your right hand's fingers. You'll notice, oh look, um, towards the inside of the loop, my fingers are pointing up. So that's the direction of the magnetic field. But then it's going to loop around like this. And the strength of the magnetic field as you get farther from the loop of current um, will drop off. This might remind you of the dipole field that we had for an electric dipole. And it turns out that the shape of this field is pretty close, not exactly the same, but very close. And if you make the dipole very small and you make the loop of current very small, they approach exactly the same thing. So a loop of current um, made small enough is very much like a magnetic dipole in a sense. Well, all right, so what do I wanna do with loop of current? I wanna stack a whole bunch of them on top of each other and come up with a thing called a solenoid. So a solenoid is just the name for a stack of circular loops of current. The way you, that you really make it is you take a, a, a single wire and you loop it around and 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 you just spiral it up. Um, but as long as the pitch of that wire looping up, um, at, you know, as, as it goes around one circumference, the distance the wire has to go up to make that spiral is small compared to the circumference. It's basically the same as a stack of circular loops of current. So that's what the black stuff is here on the left. It's current coming out of the page. On the right, it's current going into the page. Uh, but really, what we've done is we've taken a cross section of a 3D object that's a whole bunch of these loops of current. So you take that cross section, and then on one side it's coming out, the other side it's going in. Um, we're going to define N divided by L is the number of loops per length of solenoid. So if you have N current loops stacked on top of each other and it makes a solenoid that's got length L, then N over L is loops per length of solenoid. Because again, this um, expression I'm gonna give you only really works for a extremely long solenoid. But again, what does extremely long mean? It means the distance to the top or bottom of the solenoid is small compared to how far you are from one of the edges of the cylinder. And it turns out that outside an infinitely long solenoid, there's no magnetic field. That's kind of surprising. So a solenoid can contain a magnetic field. And even with a real solenoid that can't be infinite, but as long as it's long enough, the magnetic field outside the solenoid is actually pretty small, it turns out, certainly compared to inside. But then inside, the magnetic field is pretty strong. And there's a very simple expression for the strength of that magnetic field. It's mu naught, the same mu naught constant that we had before, times I times N over L. That's the strength of the magnetic field inside a solenoid. It's a uniform field. Um, it points in the direction that I've given you. Once again, you can play with um, the right-hand rule. Um, so 
here, if you look at the wires on the left, the current is sticking out of the page. Um, so you, you point your thumb out of the page here, and um, the magnetic field curves around. And notice to the right side, it's pointing in the up direction. Well, over on the right, you have the current into the page here on the right. Um, it's into the page. Well, so if I curl my finger around, hey, look to the left of it, it's in the up direction. So that works. Um, they all add up together properly. Uh, and then it, it turns out for a solenoid, there's another um, trick that you can do is that if I just curl my fingers in the direction of the um, in the direction of the current. So before I, I pointed my thumb in the direction of the current and my fingers curled for the magnetic field. For a solenoid, you go the other way around. Um, on the right side, it's going into the page. If I were to curl my fingers all the way out, or I can do it here. On the left side, it's coming out of the page. On the right side, it goes into the page. That's the direction of the current. My thumb points in the direction of the magnetic field. So a solenoid is a way to generate one of these uniform magnetic fields. And so solenoids are going to be pretty important. And we will do other things with solenoids later. All right. Well, so that's all that we have for this second magnetic field lecture. Um, I encourage you to uh, go back and rewatch anything that you're confused about. Um, please ask me questions. As I said before, sign up for the Discord. Ask me questions there. That's a good way to get a hold of me. I also have the interface on the web um, where I will be looking at questions um, over the weekends. I might be a little slow looking at them, but I will try to look at those questions every so often and answer questions there. Please stay in touch. It's going to be a little tough now that we don't see each other ever in person. We're all going to feel very disconnected. So just check in um, and make sure that you're um, keeping up with the class and make sure that you know what's going on. So what I will do in a couple of days is I will post the next homework assignment. Um, and I, we won't, I won't have, oh yeah, so there is a video. So you want to watch the regular video that you would have had to watch anyway. So I will post that, um, watch that, and then do the next homework assignment and then ask me questions about the next homework assignment. All right, that is all.